boys and girls, yet again from me, Henry. And never. Now that Henry, that's me, have composed myself from laughing, we will complete part two of the story of the Prince Sneeze. The story of a nasty fairy who has forgotten to be invited to a baby prince's christening and the spell she placed upon a baby prince. Now, just to quickly recap. There came a loud cup of thunder when the confusion was over. The court astrologer was found to have turned into an eight day clock with the sun, moon and stars arrangement, a planetary indicator and a calendar calculated for 2,000 years. Oh dear me, that's a long time. The banquet ended up rather gloomily, although the gifts of the other fairies, such as health, wealth and beauty, managed to make everyone a little bit more cheerful. When the guests were gone, the king and queen sent for Dr. Peel, the court physician, to consult him in regard to the measures which ought to be taken to prevent the prince from sneezing. As for the poor court astrologer, he was hung up in the sacristy of the cathedral, and every eight days his wife wound him up with tears. What shall we do, Doctor? asked the king rather mournfully. The prince must be preserved from the things which cause sneezing, said the doctor sagely. Such as draughts, suggested the king. Draughts, head colds, snuff, pepper, answered the leech. Let his little highness be put into a special suit of rooms. Admit no person to them until he's been examined for head cold and has put on a germ-proof garment and his little highness grows older forbid the use of pepper in his food better still if your majesty has a castle in the mountains let the prince be taken there for the sake of pure air Ooh, there is a tower on the golden mountain said the king at this the queen began to weep again for she quite naturally did not wish to part with her child. But my dear, said the king, we can't have him sneezing and things changing all the time. I beg your majesty to consider the dangers of a head cold put to the doctor. Yes, think of the dangers of a head cold, echoed the king, who saw clear in the queen that chaos might result if the prince was attacked by a prolonged fit of sneezing. The people with head colds may sneeze 10 or 15 times a day. Even 50 times a day, said the doctor. 50, echoed the king again, shaking his head, for he was torn between paternal love and his kingly duty. Imagine 50 enchantments in a day. By eventide, the whole kingdom will be upset, undone, and the people plotting a revolution. The Tower of the Golden Mountain is a fine, healthy locality, said the doctor, and the prince could be brought up as happily there as in the palace. So at length the queen consented. In a few days, the little prince, who had not sneezed a second time, was removed from the tower on the Golden Mountain. His room, designed by Dr. Phil, was completely protected from traps, and every breath of air that ended it was tried by sterilised. Mr. Pill, who had been a hospital nurse, took care of him three times a week on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays. His royal parents rode out of the tower and after putting on germ-proof garments, were admitted to the nursery of their infant soon. And so the years went by, but nobody was able to break Malova's spell, and the clue as to doing had been carried away by the wind. 
Malvolia herself had disappeared. The prince became a handsome little boy indeed. An accomplished teacher taught him history, music, drawing, dancing and all of the things that a prince ought to know. But of real life he knew absolutely nothing at all. His most beautiful friend, or faithful friend in those days, was a French poodle, who spoke both French and English exceedingly well. Of course he had a marked canine accent, rather growling his G's and howling his O's and O's, but his words were chosen and his vocabulary extensive was never a more friendly, wise and devoted animal. When the king decided to have him sent away for a while, for he feared that his son was getting a touch of Poldo's barky manner of speaking, far too close an association, the little prince became really ill from grief, and the king was forced to alter his decision. During his imprisonment in the tower, in spite of all the precaution, the prince sneezed three times. At the first sneeze, all the dogs in the kingdom, except Poldo, changed into cats, and all the cats into dogs. Though this was not a serious trouble, the change was certainly inconvenient. All the dogs and cats came out, meowing at people as the dogs used to bark at them, and they chased people down the street. The cat stroke dogs, on the other hand, stayed in the kitchen under the stove and watched for mice in the pantry. Great St. Bernard dogs might be seen licking their paws and rubbing them over their foreheads and fat old cat laps. Dogs used to try and purr. At the second sneeze, all the elderly gentlemen over 70 changed into elm trees, a proceeding that caused a terrible lot of trouble. At the third sneeze, all the people in the pictures of the art museum became alive, and for a week the soldiers of the Royal Guard spent most of their time rescuing poor bewildered forms, satyrs, nymphs, Roman centres, and long dead celebrities and historical personages from the worst destitution. The king finally had to build a special castle just for them. As the prince's 21st birthday drew near, he began to feel very, very sad at the idea of having to stay shut up in the tower all his life. Though he was very brave and very manly for a young man, he lay down on his couch and wept in sorrow. Suddenly, standing with his forepaws on the coverlet, Why do you weep, dear master? said the little dog. At my feet, replied the poor prince, I cannot bear to think that I may have to spend all my days in this tower and never see the great wide world. The poodle was silent for a minute. At length he said, Dear Prince Rolander, do not give up. Have you ever thought of consulting my old master, the giant of the North Pole? He has a large chest in his palace full of secrets which the wind has overheard, and perhaps the key to Malvolia's spell is among them. If you have a warm fur coat and four, and four fur booties made for me, I will go to the giant and ask him. The prince gave his consent, and on the next day, the royal tailor made the poodle a magnificent sealskin coat and four splendid fur-lined boots. Then the king wished him godspeed. The queen cried over him, and the prince who could see from high tower every corner of the kingdom watched him till he disappeared over the hills and far away. Straight north the poodle ran. Soon he left the fertile plains behind him and entered great black pine forests where never a road was ever seen. 
The cool wind howled through the trees, and that night, brilliant stars sparkled over the dark and weaving branches. Hungry wolves and savage bears often pursued him, but somehow he always managed to escape them all. At the end of the forest he found the frozen ocean, lit by the shuddering light of the aurora, flashing in a great fan from the east to west, past white tusked walruses and sleepy penguins. He flew on till the eleventh year he saw the green icy pinnacles of the giant's palace against the waving curtain of the polar lights on the evening of the twelfth year. He entered the castle. The giant of the North Pole was a tall, strong, yellow-haired fellow, wearing a crown of ice and a great sweeping mantle made from white fur of the polar bear. His servants were the ghosts' strange supply, shadowy creatures moving quickly to and fro, and his courtiers were the whirlwinds and the storms. The giant's wife sat by his side, he had dark hair and eyes of ice, which were burning blue. Welcome, little Paul Dwarf, said the giant, and his voice sounded like the wind in the treetops. What seek you here? I seek some words of the fairy Malvolia, which was carried away by the northeast wind at Prince Rolando's christening, replied the poor woo Woohoo! whistled the giant of the North Pole. If I have them, the words are yours. He summoned two gusts to bring forth the chest of secrets. It was made of the black stone and edged with diamonds of ice. In it was stored all the mysteries which the wind had ever overheard. There were secrets, confessions, vows, merry laughs and simple words. And sure enough, in the corner of the chest lay the rest of Malvolia's spell. A row of little old-fashioned dusty words. The words until he finds someone brave enough to marry him. So the good poodle learned the words by heart, thanked the giant and hurried home with the message. When he came to the king's palace, he ran barking and joy right into the king's own room. There he saw the unhappy parents. Have you found the last sentence, cried the queen. Yes, said Paul Dwarf, the, spill, the spell will end when the prince marries. That very evening the king and queen sent forth ambassadors to ask for the hand of the loveliest princess of all fairyland, Princess Adartha of the Adamant Mountains. But so afraid was Adartha of being turned into something else, she refused the offer. Oh dear, the king and the queen then made a request for the hand of the princess Alicia of the Crystal Lakes. But Alicia was also afraid of being turned into something else, and she too refused the alliance. Soon the did, so did the princess of the Golden Coast, on the princess of the Seven Cities, and many, many others to follow. Finally, the only princess left in all fairyland was a princess who herself lay under an enchantment. A jealous witch had turned her golden hair bright blue and gave her a nose a foot long. This unhappy maiden was the only princess willing to accept poor Rondor. The wedding day arrived. The prince threw perhaps a little pale from his confined life looked very handsome and led his ugly bride to the altar like a man. Just as exactly as the marriage ceremony was half over, a spasm contorted the muscles of the prince's face. The poor young man felt strangely inclined to sneeze, though he could be seen making heroic efforts to control the impulse. The audience got very nervous indeed and very panicky. All was in vain. 
the princess sneezed. Could you? A terrific clap of thunder rent the air and everybody looked about to see what was happening. The effect of the sneeze was an odd one, as it had occurred exactly at the moment when the prince was half married. The spell had reacted upon itself just like the kick from a gun. Dr. Phil said next year. The cats became dogs again, the dogs became cats, the elm trees became cross elderly gentlemen looking for their families. The poor excited Roman senators, forms, myths and satires, celebrities and historical personages went back to their pictures in the gallery. And to cap the climax, the ugly bride became once more her sweet and lovable self. While everybody was cheering, who should walk out of the sarcastry? with the court astrologer and instant later he had fallen into the affectionate arms of his fearful wife who had worn him up for 200 years. After the wedding reception the prince and his bride went on honeymoon to the enchanted islands. As for Paul Doe the Poodle, he was created prime minister and lived to a fine old age. Well children, if you like this bedtime story, don't forget to press the like button, hit the bell and subscribe. So from Henry and Nipper, it's nighty night children, nighty night, nighty night.